Hi, friends. Uh, so after a short break of two weeks uh, due to the vacations, Christmas, New Year and all, hope you all had a relaxing time and a good time. We are back in business. So the business of academics today in this new year starts with a lecture on microbiology for the intensivist. And uh, the speaker is Dr. Neha Gupta, who's earlier been on our webinars. She's taken a very nice lectures earlier, which many of you have gone through and attended. So the topic is microbiology for the intensivist. And Dr. Neha Gupta is uh, a senior ID physician and a senior consultant yep. at this hospital, Gurgaon. And we are actively involved in academic sessions, especially of uh, CIDS and uh, so many other organizations. So over to you, Dr. Neha. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Tapesh, for this opportunity here. And we are going to discuss uh, regarding microbiology for the intensivist. So, shall I share my screen? Yeah. yeah please. Is it busy? Is it visible? No, no, it's not sharing screen yet. Yeah, so my son is here and he is He's distracting you. <laughs> hey, why is it not changing now? Is it visible now? Yeah, right. So we are going to discuss regarding the... We are going to discuss regarding the microbiology for the endurance. Just give me two minutes. Just give me two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, is it visible now? Yeah, please tell him. But uh, my uh, my video is not coming. Meaning what? Not my background. So no, I think it's because of this. Yes. No, no, it's no, because of this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I'm Dr. Neha Gupta, Senior Infectious Diseases Physician. This is my email ID. Uh, and this is my phone number, 888-292-7905. I'm currently attached with Fortis Memorial Research Institute. And I'm the founder of NGSWAS, which is the Infectious Diseases Clinic, or my little venture in Gurgaon. So I will begin with this quote from my mentor, Dr. Rajiv Soman, um, who says that we live in a sea of microbes and these microbes would contaminate any clinical specimen and can colonize, colonize almost any body surface. So whenever we send specimen for the cultures, it's, and if the culture is positive, it's important for us to distinguish that positive culture whether it's a contamination, it's a colonization, or it's a true infection. This is because dismissing a colonizer can have an adverse outcome in the patient. However, if you are treating all the positive cultures, that can result in overtreatment. It can result in delay in surgery, also added toxicities, interactions uh, between the various drugs and the other agents which the patient is on. Of course, it adds to the healthcare cost and also selects out the healthcare or uh, selects out the resistance. So it's very important to um, differentiate a positive culture and at the same time, also send the cultures appropriately, which we will discuss in the further uh, slides. 
So today we are going to discuss the first is whether if a culture report is available to us, whether it's reliable or not reliable, then what is a clinical interpretation of the cultures? We're going to discuss regarding the susceptibility, the mechanism of resistance, as well as on the MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration. We, we are going to discuss what is the implication of these culture reports and how do we select our antibiotic therapy, both empirical as well as definitive antibiotic therapy. What is the value of the molecular assays in the today's scenario? when we are diagnosing or we are managing the various infections as well as sepsis syndromes. And sometimes we have to even go beyond the obvious cultural susceptibility report and choose our antibiotic therapy. So let's just first uh, take up the first one, which is reliable or not. So we must have seen a culture report like this a lot of times in our clinical practice. This is a 65 year old lady who presented a fever dysuria frequency that is suggestive of acute pyelonephritis and a lot of patients with UTI come to the ICU with severe infection or at times with shock as well and this is the culture report. So based on this culture report what will you prescribe? We have ciprofloxacin which is at 3 plus, amikacin which is at 4 plus, cefixime which is present uh, at 2 plus and um, none of or none of the above. So whenever we see a culture report like this with plus, 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 this is an outdated way of reporting. Nowadays, it has to be reported as either susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. Remember, S is for susceptible. It's not for sensitive. So the correct terminology used should be susceptible. And... Um, it is basically what is the meaning of the susceptibility, intermediate or the resistance? It is that if a, a particular isolate is given or a strain is reported as susceptible, that means that the antibiotic is likely to work more than 95% of the time. So 94 to 98% is predictor of success. If suppose it is intermediate, then the chances are lesser. However, it can still work and close to 67 to 90% chances of um, still success is there or the antibiotic can work against that particular infection based on what is the doses which are being used, what is the probability of source control as well. And um, if suppose it is resistant, then it is not that it is not going to work, but yes, the chances definitely go down drastically. So the first take-home message is it's very important to first look at the report and analyze whether it's reliable or not reliable. The second is, uh, if, uh, is the clinical interpretation of the cultures. And uh, I, will, um, um, I will actually discuss this with the help of this case, which probably I must have discussed it earlier also, but it's a nice case to discuss a couple of uh, um, scenarios here. This is a 74-year-old gentleman with hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease. And in 2008, he had undergone CABG. Now in August 2013, he presented elsewhere with paraplegia and also underwent a post-lumbar decompression surgery. A post-decompression this surgery a month later, this patient presented to us in Midanta, where um, I was working for close to 10 years earlier, with severe infection. He was in sepsis. And this was the urine culture report, which we see as Pseudomonas species. And the colony count was significant with 10 to the power of 5. And here, the cholestin was reported as sensitive. Ideally, it should be intermediate in the current scenario or reported as susceptible. But uh, this was cholestin sensitive. Mainly, if you look at the susceptibility of the carbapenems, the imi and the mino were resistant. So based on this, what will what is the most appropriate step in the management of this patient? Prescribe amikacin, which was reported again as susceptible. Prescribe colistin with miropenem, which is the combination therapy for the carbapenem resistant um, gram negative infections. Or we need further information regarding the MIC, so we need to discuss it with our microbiology or none of the above. So as a clinician, it's very important to first see whether this positive urine culture is really a true infection or it's a contamination or a colonization. 
So we went back into the history and this patient had undergone a lumbar decompression surgery. Post that surgery, this patient had a silicon catheter in situ, which was in place for close to a month. The creatinine of this patient, despite being in such severe infection, was not high. If it is a UTI, the creatinine will go up. This was not high. And plus, our ultrasound which was done did not show any perinephric path stranding. So there was no evidence of pyelonephritis. So this is a very likely a colonization. It is a catheter-associated asymptomatic bacteriodulia. So as an infectious disease, what is the next step to do? The next step is go back again to the history, history. And not just an ID. I think for every clinician, the most important is a good history taking. So when we went back into the history, this patient was admitted earlier in the month of July. Uh, this was basically with severe infection. So there was septicemia, lower respiratory tract infection, and there was step septicemia reported in the discharge summary in the, from the Department of Cardiology and Staphylococcus aureus was isolated. So there was severe infection with 26,000 counts at that point. And this patient also had a blood culture, which was Staphylococcus aureus, which was oxacillin susceptible. So this was a MSSA. Now this patient was discharged with septum and augmentin for a week's time. And then later on also was advised to take levofloxacin. Now remember for MSSA, these are not the drug of choices. Later in the month of August, from July to August, this patient presented again this time he was admitted in the department of neurosurgery. Why? Because he had severe backache because of the paravertebral collection. So there was vertebral osteomyelitis with this paravertebral collection. And also there was empyema, which was on the right side. Again, the blood cultures were positive with Staphylococcus aureus. And the pus from the paravertebral collection also grew Staphylococcus aureus. So this was a case of complicated MSSA bacteremia with vertebral osteomyelitis as well as empyema with a catheter-associated asymptomatic bacteria. Now, what is the clinical implication? The clinical imp implication and the impact is that instead of really starting the patient on colistin and meropenem for that urine culture positive for the pseudomonas, this patient has to be on an effective anti-MSSA therapy, which would be cloxacillin or a flucloxacillin. So this is why it's so important to interpret every positive culture report and differentiate colonization versus infection. And there are several factors which we have to keep in mind to differentiate colonization from infection. And the first one begins with what is the site of the specimen which has been taken? For example, whether it is a sterile site or is it a non-sterile site? So whether it is a sterile site, so blood, CSF, pleural fluid, as well as acytic fluid, or a freshly placed drain of less than 24 hours is a sterile site. And specimens which are collected from these are likely to be pathogen. Whereas if a collection is done from a non-sterile site, for example, urine, urinary catheter, uh, especially if it is more than 24 hours, throat swab or a drain fluid, then these are more, uh, these are non-sterile sites. Then the next step is to see what is the organism which is isolated. For example, if it is a blood, but the blood is growing coagulase negative staphylococcus, that is instead of staphylococcus aureus, it is a staphylococcus hemolyticus or epidermidis which is growing, that is the cons. And these are the normal contaminants of the skin. So these are the likely contaminations or colonizations rather than true infection. However, then suppose you have a cons being isolated multiple times. If the time to positivity is less than 16 hours, if there is a process is in place like a central line or a HD catheter, then this cons will become a true pathogen. So the other probable uh, the other parameter which we have to count is the presence of processes as well. 
we have to look into the clinical status of the patient. That is, uh, for example, if a patient is in the ICU and there is a budding yeast cells which are growing from the urine or even from the ET aspirate or the tra tracheostomy TT aspirate. But if the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, if the patient is asymptomatic, then these BYCs mostly represent colonization rather than flu infection. However, if the patient is symptomatic, then we have to treat it accordingly. Immune status. Neutropenic patients who have got asymptomatic bacteria, candiduria, they have to be treated, whereas uh, we don't have to treat this in patients who are, um, uh, uh, we don't have to treat it if the patient is immunocompetent, like patients who are having diabetes and just a positive urine culture, we don't have to treat it. Then a very important is the compatible radiology. Whenever there is a culture positive from the, say, the TT aspirate or the ET aspirate, then uh, we have to look into it, whether the chest X-ray is also showing uh, compatible radiological signs, there is a consolidation or not. And if there is a consolidation, that will be more suggestive. And of course, very important is compatible histopathology also, if there is a biopsy which is being done. And if there is invasion, that will be suggestive of a true infection rather than colonization. Now, coming to this patient who had a catheter-associated asymptomatic bacteriuria, there is a 5% incidence of bacteriuria per day of catheterization, and only 20% of them become symptomatic. Out of these, only 4% are bacteremic, which is usually associated with patients who are immunosuppressed or patients who are diabetic, patients who are on steroids and pre-existing or obstructive renal disease, uh, which means that if a patient out of, uh, if a patient is catheterized for seven days, then 25% of the patients will have a positive urine culture. And in patients who are catheterized, again, urine routine is not to be sent because that will show pus cells as well as the RBCs. So urine routine in a catheter sample does not really give us any clue towards uh, whether it is uh, going to be infection or a colonization. Um, uh, if a patient is supposed catheterized for 30 days, then 100% of the patients are likely to have a positive culture from the urinary catheter sample. This is one of the slides which again just suggests that if suppose we have a blood culture positive, then if it is growing GPC, then there are several possibilities including the coagulase negative staphylococcus, staphylococcus aureus, streptococci, enterococci, but Based on whether it is clusters or chains, we can kind of differentiate. Chains will be more of streptococcus or enterococcus. Clusters are more, mostly going to be staphylococcus aureus or the coagulase negative staphylococcus. And then whether it is a contamination or a true infection. So a single positive blood culture for cons is very likely a contamination and is not to be treated. Whenever we, blood cultures are always the gold standard and it's very important to send appropriate samples for the blood cultures. Um, it should be done before initiation of the antibiotic therapy because antibiotics, they decrease the, sens the sensitivity of isolating the bacteria. If you're sending only one bottle of blood culture, the sensitivity of isolating the organism is just 10 to 15%. However, if you're sending sets, one set is two bottles, which could be two aerobic or preferably one aerobic and the second one anaerobic. So it's one set from one percutaneous puncture. And if suppose the patient is in the ICU, then central line and peripheral percutaneous puncture, two sets ideally should be sent. Otherwise, preferably three sets because as we increase the number of sets, the sensitivity increases from 65% to 80% and then 80% to 95%. It has to be clean method of collection and clean the top of the bottle with 0.5% of chlorhexidine with the alcohol. Uh, this, once we, are, we have collected the sample, there is no need to change the needle and it should be inoculated first and never refrigerated. Most of the organisms, the pathogens, they grow within the first 24 hours. So it is not true when they say that the blood culture report is going to come only after five days. No, not really. Most of the pathogens, 80% of them, they grow within the first 24 hours. In fact, Staphylococcus aureus, 
a lot of times can grow 12 hours, 16 hours. This is how, in, including the GNB, they grow very fast. Uh, the ideal time to collection is has no relationship to the fever spike. It can be done irrespective of the spike of fever. Most important is the volume and the ratio of blood to broth, which should be ideally 1 is to 5 to 1 is to 10. So ideally in a blood culture bottle, 8 to 10 ml of blood should be inoculated. And if suppose we are suspecting some uh, um, difficult to grow organisms, say brucella, then the incubation of the blood cultures can be done for a longer period of time, maybe around 15 days. Coming to urine samples, how should the urine sample be collected? It has to be midstream sample collection always. And it has to be uh, after cleaning and drying the genital area. For patients who are catheterized, which is going to be more so in the ICU patients, there has to be a catheter with a separate port. So separate port for collection, it should not be opened up. There should not be discontinuation of the closed system. And it should be quickly transported to the lab. Um, besides, we can sometimes use these dip slides, uh, which can be uh, used. And when we use this, the it is inoculation and incubation starts immediately. Now, there can be another scenario like this when there is a patient who is having acute pyelonephritis is already on antibiotics and the urine routine shows pus cells. However, the report from the lab comes that the organism which is grown is insignificant, has an insignificant colony count. Now, this is because the patient is already on antibiotics, but it's very important for the clinician to interact with the microbiology friend and tell them that yes, we are suspecting a UTI and whatever organism comes out, please report it because the susceptibility is important. Why see, we are giving PIPTAS six hourly. The patient, if it gets better and goes home, can't take six hourly. But if we know that yes, there is artapenem which is susceptible or if there is some other oral antibiotic which can be given to the patient, then de-escalation is possible. So this is again very, very important that a clinical correlation with the clinician and the microbiology team because this insignificant colony count in the lab is clinically very, very significant and they actually have this invaluable DSD which should be reported. Now, coming to another syndrome, a patient presenting with 35-year-old gentleman presenting with fever, headache, altered sensorium, and MRI is showing basal meningitis. As you can see here, there is leptomeningeal enhancement. How should the CSF sample be collected? This is very important. Just remember CMH, that is uh, the first sample has to be collected for the chemistry. The second sample has to be collected for the microbiology because it has to be the clean catch. And then third needs to go for the hematology. And ideally collect as much as possible based on the CSF opening pressures, but preferably try to collect around 20 ml. And out of this, for the gram stain, the CSF should be sent uh, at least one ml. For the cultures, the CSF can be inoculated directly into the blood culture bottles. It increases the sensitivity of isolating the bacteria. And so it is basically around 5 ml for the aerobic cultures, 5 ml for the TB midget cultures, 5 to 30 ml for the, uh, for the fungi, which again can be inoculated into the blood culture bottles and gene expert 2 ml. And then we also have the other molecular assays. So for that around 1 to 2 ml. So this is... Um, contributed by my um, previous ID fellow, Dr. Prerna Gurana, who is a microbiologist um, and a leading one right now. So again, the CSF samples, they need to be transported to the lab immediately. They should never be refrigerated uh, because bacterial pathogens are cold sensitive. And however, if suppose they are not rapidly processed, they can be incubated at 35 degrees centigrade, except that CSF for viral studies can be refrigerated as long as 23, uh, 23 hours after the collection. Coming to pneumonia, this is uh, one of the most important syndromes which we see in the clinical practice. A lot of patients either present with pneumonia or are hospitalized and then are intubated or have a tracheostomy and then developed a HAP or a VAP. So whenever there is a sample which is collected, and nowadays, there is a re new recommendation that 
it is not necessary for us to do a mini bowel always to know what is the what what bacteria is growing. Uh, even a TT aspirate is representative, or a ET aspirate is representative of the possible organism for the pneumonia. It's very important to look into the gram stain. That what is the quality of the sample? If the sample has is of um, good quality, then the pus cells will be more than 10 and the squamous epithelial cells will be less than 25. However, if the sample, um, if the pus cells are less than 10, that is there are not much of neutrophils, then it is a poor sample and more of squamous epithelial cells per low power field, more than 25 is going to be a poor sample. And if suppose you have a culture report which is available, always correlated with the gram stain. Culture is positive, but gram stain is negative. Then it has it is not not really significant. But there is also a catch here that the gram stain also should be done properly by the microbiology team. If it is not seen properly and not reported, then it will be a um, not a very concordant report. So. Um, then we come to the bowel. Uh, if suppose there is a colony count, which is more than 10 to the power of five colony forming units, without antibiotics is significant. With antibiotics, 10 to the power of four colony forming units uh, is significant. And uh, very important is that if there is no, um, if, it's, uh, if the gram stain or the culture is negative for the staph aureus or the GNB in a good quality specimen prior to the start of antibiotics, then it is less likely to be because the pneumonia is like less likely to be because of these two etiologies. So if suppose a patient has started on meropenem and tycoplanin and the gram stain and the cultures do not show any GPC in cluster and do not grow any MRSA or MSSA, then we can discontinue the tycoplanin and continue with the beta-lactam therapy for the gram-negative infection. Similarly, suppose a gram, a patient is presenting with pneumonia, which is because of viral etiology, and then the gram stain is negative for the GNB. Again, de-escalation or discontinuation of the antibiotics can also be considered. So the take-home message here is that it's important to differentiate any positive culture with whether it's a colonization or infection. And always remember that a single blood culture positive for a staph aureus or a candida is never a colonizer. It is always, always significant. Now let's discuss regarding the susceptibility, the mechanism of resistance, as well as the MIC. Um, how do we routinely perform the AST, which is antimicrobial susceptibility testing? So the routine methods include the distribution test, which is by this, uh, in the Petri dish, the antibiotic impregnated disc are dropped in. And based on the diameter of the zone, we calculate whether it's susceptible or it's resistant. We also were doing it earlier by this broth microdilution methods or by the e-test. But nowadays, most of the labs in the tertiary care centers have adopted to the automated microdilution test, which are these automated machines, which tell us regarding the susceptibility or the resistance pattern of the particular bacterial isolate. There are certain specific methods for detection of the resistance as well. That is, we have this phenotypic detection of the beta lactamases, which is based on the susceptibility report. And we also have this genotypic detection, which can detect the various mechanism of resistance for the gram negatives, as well as MECT gene, can also be detected by certain, geno uh, certain um, molecular assays. That is for the MRSA. So, when we talk about the gram negatives, with gram negatives, it's difficult to be positive because there is so many mechanism of resistance. We have overexpression of the efflux pumps, which give resistance to the beta lactams, besides to the quinolones, tetracyclines, and minoglycosides, as well as to the chloramphenicols. There is loss of porin channels, which result in resistance to the inipenem. Besides, there is antibiotic modifying enzymes, there are ribosomal mutations, there are target mutations for the DNA kinase as well as the tocoisomerase 4, which result in resistance to the cumulal loans. And there are certain bypass targets, which are also modified, giving resistance to the TMP-SMH, 
but majority of the resistance in the gram negative infections are because of the beta lactamases which are present in the periplasmic space and these result in hydrolysis of the beta lactams which includes penicillin cephalosporins as well as the carbapenems so the beta lactamases can be classified as serine enzymes or the metalloenzymes the serine enzymes include the class a 10 mshv esbls kpcs class d oxa which is and this includes the oxa 48 class c mcbl all of them, they hydrolyze the penicillin, cephalosporins, as well as the carbapenems. But I will explain how we can predict whether it's an AMC or it's a ESBL alone. And then we have metallo beta lactamases, which are uh, belonging to the class B metalloenzymes. What is the clinical implication of it? It is that if it is a TEM SHV, which is TEM12 and SHV1, they hydrolyze the ampicillin they do not hydrolyze third generation cephalosporins and they are inhibited by the clavulonic acid, sulbactam and the tazobactam. So in the susceptibility report, you will see ampicillin resistant, but amoxicillin clavulonic acid will be susceptible. So that is going to be a MSHV, which is TEM12 and SHV1. We have further enzymes from two onwards in Temonira enzyme, which is TEM3 or SHV2. These are the ESBLs. ESBLs is extended spectrum beta lactamases. That is because these are the beta lactamases which are hydrolyzing the extended spectrum beta lactams, which are the third generation cephalosporins, which includes ceftazidine, cefotaxim, and astronum. So in the susceptibility report, you will see resistance to the third generation cephalosporin, ceftriaxone resistant, ceftazidine resistant, but there will be susceptibility to the BL-BLI combinations, that is to the papyrocillin tazobactam or including the cefepirazone selbactam and also amoxicillin clavulonic acid. If it is a non-CTXM strain, that will be susceptible. The CTXM ESBLs are the ones which are not inhibited by the clavulonic acid. So there will be resistance to the third generation cephalosporins, but susceptibility to the BL, BLI combinations of selbactam and tazobactam. Here, clavulonic acid is going to be resistant. So we cannot use amoxicillin clavulonic acid here for the CTXM ESBLs. And CTXM15 is the most common ESBL, which is prevalent in our country. So um, when we look at the susceptibility report, it's important to identify what is the possible mechanism of resistance so that we can choose our antibiotic therapy. So let's take up this example of, again, a patient who is, a 45, who is a 45 year old gentleman with pyelonephritis, septic shock, and both the urine as well as the blood cultures are growing the gram-negative bacilli, which grew this E. coli. And as we can see here, this is, uh, this is, resistant to the third generation cephalosporins. Now, with this particular susceptibility report, what do you think is the likely mechanism of resistance here? So here we have third generation cephalosporin resistant. When we have third generation resistance, look at the BLB-like combination. Cephaparison cellbactam is susceptible. Peptaz is susceptible. Look at the astronom. Astronom is um, not really reported here, but that's, that is okay. So um, we have, uh, uh, this is basically an ESBL because it is resistant to the third generation cephalosporins as well as to the astronom, but susceptible to the blb like combination. So um, what about, so this is how we need to look into the susceptibility report. Um, whenever we look at the susceptibility report, I, what we do is we don't look at what is susceptible. We try to analyze first what is the mechanism of resistance. So we look at what is resistant. So first look at, very easy is first look at the third generation cephalosporins. And then if it is resistant, look at the blb like combination. If the blb like combination is susceptible, then it's going to be an ESBL, which is going to be predominantly TEM3, SHV2, CTXM. And suppose the amoxicillin clavulonic acid is susceptible, then it would be a non-CTXM ESBL. If it is amoxicillin clavulonic resistant, 
then it is a CTXN or CTXN extended spectrum beta lactamase. Now, in the current scenario, as we are seeing more and more carbapenem resistant gram negative infections, the next is we can also look at the carbapenems. And when we look at the carbapenem, suppose the carbapenem is uh, resistant, then it is going to be a carbapenemase. And then we have to further identify whether the mechanism of resistance is OXA48 or it is a NDM. Uh, again, if suppose we have the carbapen, the BLV like combination like Piptaz or the Cefepirazine sulbactam is intermediate, like if it is intermediate, then carbapenem, and if carbapenem is susceptible, then we have to see whether it is, the possibilities are whether it's AMC, OXA, or ESBL with others. So here we will look at the susceptibility of cefepime. If cefepime is susceptible, then it will be AMC. And if cefepime is resistant, then it is likely to be OXA or a combination of ESBL with some other mechanism like efflux perm or loss of purin channels, etc. So now with this, I will move on to the discussion for MICs, which is also very important. This may, I, is, may I interrupt? Huh? Tell me. Yeah, so, you know, so how does this really give you additional uh, clinical uh, help, you know, identifying all this, you know, the, the, the genotype over the phenotype? If you can just explain that, because I think that is very important. Yes. So when we know that it is an ESBL organism, Huh? For example, in this particular patient, this is an ESBL E. coli. Here we have other susceptibility reports also, like we have um, cholestin, which is susceptible, or we have TG cyclin as susceptible. Uh, so instead of using cholestin, the, the options better would be EMI Mero or if it is a BLBLI combination depending on the severity of illness. If it's a very severe illness, then we can go ahead with meropenem. And if it is a not so severe illness, then even blv like combinations as it is a UTI that can also be used. So um, it is the mechanic, for example, here, if suppose we know uh, it's a CRE, carbapenem resistant anterior bacteria, say, and we have susceptibility, then we need to check. I'm actually coming to that in the further slides. Oh, also. Sorry, yeah, please. But uh, we need to know what is the mechanism, like with the, it is OXA48, if it is OXA48 alone, then we, we can use cas which is septicidium avibactin. Whereas if it is an NDM, then polymyxin-based therapy or a combination of cas with astronam based on what is the phenotypic susceptibility report. So that can be the that can be the treatment option. Is it clear? Is it? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's okay. That's fine. That is just because I think that is something they always want to know. How does it? Yeah. yeah. So exactly. So what is very important is that you will have a report, uh, and you will have BLB layer combination, imipenem, meropenem, colistin susceptible, but if suppose you have a sevaporizin, selvactam, imimero, and colistin then it is better to use a BLBLI combination rather than, or a, or a carbapenem, uh, rather than a colistin. And again, there are several other factors which we have to take into account. We have to take into account what is the site of infection, what is the inoculum. These are the other factors which have to be considered. And if they know, and the severity of illness as well. So here, uh, now we move on to this next case, which is a patient with pyelonephritis again. This is a patient who has got, young girl who has got E. coli in the urine. And this was the culture and susceptibility report. Here we have colistin as S. This is an old report. In the current scenario, as the um, reporting method for colistin or the polymixes have changed, we are going to have either intermediate or only resistant there will not be any reporting of susceptibility. So we have colistin reported here as susceptible with a MIC value of 0.25. There is meropenem reported again susceptible with a MIC of 0.25. Piptas susceptible at 4. TMP susceptible at, with a MIC of 20. There is artepenem susceptible with a MIC of 0.5. 
there is amikacin susceptible with MIC of 4. There is amoxicillin clavulonic acid, which is also susceptible at a MIC of 4. So what will you use in this particular patient? Um, this with this, and this actually brings us to the discussion of what is MIC. So MIC is defined as the lowest concentration of the antimicrobial that inhibits the growth of the microorganisms. And as I mentioned earlier, it was traditionally being identified with the help of this broth microdilution test or with the help of this e-test. But now more and more, we have this reporting system from the automated systems. What is breakpoint? Breakpoint is a chosen concentration of an antibiotic which defines whether the species of the bacteria is susceptible or is resistant to that antibiotic. And it is identified as a standard and based on the various clinical trials. So breakpoint is going to be a particular, uh, it's going to be for the whole species of the bacteria, whereas MIC is going to be for that particular isolate. So if the MIC is less than or equal to the susceptibility breakpoint, the bacteria is considered to be susceptible to the antibiotic. So ideally, uh, the MIC, whatever is reported, that needs to be compared with the susceptibility breakpoint, which is a standard breakpoint based on the various clinical trials. So we have it's MIC. Given by UCAST, I mean, it's given by UCAST as well as the CLSI, and it is not reported in the in the culture and uh, in the TST reports. So we have the susceptibility breakpoint or the now cutoff is like two. Uh, basically, um, less than 0.5 in, uh, will, be will be intermediate uh, for the cholestin. And here we have cholestin, the earlier breakpoint was two. The meropenem MIC uh, is um, for the E. coli, the breakpoint is one. And we have fibrocillin tazobactam, which is at four, but the susceptibility breakpoint is 64. The ratio is a lot more. Um, then we have TMPS mix again, the susceptibility breakpoint is 40. So even though the MIC is 20, in the absolute numbers, that is vertically, if you look at it, the MIC seems to be very, very high and we may not choose TMPS mix. But when it is compared with its susceptibility breakpoint, then it is less, much less. So this is, and plus this is a drug which achieves very good concentration both in the renal parenchyma as well as in the urine. So this is a good drug for the pyelonephritis. We also have artepinib where the susceptibility breakpoint is 0.5. Amikacin again is susceptible with a good ratio because it's four times, the MIC is four times lower than the susceptibility breakpoint. And this is amoxicillin clavulonic acid again. It's uh, two times lower than the susceptibility breakpoint. So here, the options for the pyelonephritis can be initially by the time the patient is in the ICU and is already started on meropenem. Once the patient improves, then, and we have the DST report like this, we can de-escalate down to TMP-SMX as well, or to even artepenem and then go on to the oral TMP estimates because artepenem is not available as a, like it's only an IV formulation. So as an oral drug, even TMP SMX, although it has an MIC value of 20, but the ratio is lower than the susceptibility, susceptibility breakpoint can be used. So the take home message is that it's important to identify the susceptibility as well as the mechanism of resistance. So know whether it is an ESBL or not. If ESBL, then you can use bl beta combination or carbapenem. If it is a carbapenem resistant, then the option is polymyxin-based therapy or uh, Kazavi uh, astronom or Kazavi based on whether it's OXA48 or OXA48 with NTM or other molecules like TG cycline, minocycline, aminoglycosides, combination of phosphomycin, these will be the other options for the carbapenem resistant gram negative infections. And always compare it horizontally, not vertically. So compare the MICs with the susceptibility breakpoints. Now, coming to antibiotic therapy, uh, we'll just discuss briefly regarding how do we choose our empirical and definitive antibiotic therapy. This is a 56-year-old gentleman who had undergone CABG. And then on day five, he developed this sudden onset leukocytosis. 
hypotension, cardiac arrest. So there was basically septic shock. He had to be revived with a CPR. Uh, the possibility in this particular patient, because this is a sudden onset illness, the and he had a central line in situ, clapsy was uh, was um, thought of, and the line was immediately changed. Now, when we look at the antibiotic history, this patient is on cefepirazone selvactam, 1.5 grams, 12 hourly. Now, with this particular uh, probability of site of infection, which is likely to be bacteremia and clapsy, and the antibiotic which the patient is receiving, and with the prior information of what is the likely organism in the ICU, this patient was not just put on meropenem, but on a combination therapy of polymyxin B with meropenem at that point, because of the possibility of the CRE. Whenever there's a breakthrough infection on a blb combination, the likely organism is going to be a carbapenem resistant gram negative rather than a, a carbapenem susceptible one. So the patient improved and discharged because everything was done very, very quickly. And it's later on, uh, we had already started the patient on polymyxin B based therapy. It's later that the blood culture, both from the central line as well as from the peripheral line, grew this Klebsiella pneumoniae, which was carbapenem resistant. So here you can see Imimero both resistant with an MIC of more than 16. And DTP was more than 12 hours. That is the central line grew 12 hours earlier than the peripheral blood culture. So this was a Klebsi. And uh, another point which I would like to discuss here is when you just look at only one culture report, here you have a cholestin which is reported as susceptible. But when you look at the other culture report, it also has additional phosphomycin susceptibility. So this is very important and always look at all the culture reports, look at the mechanism of resistance, and then you look at the various other options for it. So if it is a carbapenem resistant one, look at the polymyxin, look at the other options like phosphomycin. And if it is not reported, ask your microbiology to do the testing for it. Again, for example, if suppose this was an intra-abdominal infection and the same bacteria, ask also for the TG cyclin because it has got a good intra-abdominal concentration or even minocyclin. So um, the, um, this is basically the susceptibility data from one of the tertiary care centers in 2017. And I'm sure all of us would be seeing the same. It's just that the meropenem susceptibility of E. coli as well as the Klebsiella pneumoniae is very, very low. And we are seeing resistant isolates. It's very important to have a hospital antibiogram, which is a periodic summary of the local isolates. And it can be used for making an antibiotic policy for empirical therapy, monitoring the resistant trends over time. And it will be a guide for the infection control. And if you know that what is the antibiotic resistant pattern in our particular ICU or in the wards, this will definitely help us in identifying uh, which antibiotic which should be started if a patient is in the ICU and we have a lot of acinetobacter uh, species, then of course polymyxin B has to be started empirically. Uh, and we cannot really use always a casavi based therapy as such empirically. And how do we make this antibiotic policy? So basically microbiology will is the backbone for it. And they uh, do it based on the various different sites. So it's respiratory, CSF, urine, as well as the blood cultures. All different sites have to be, or the cultures have to be collected. And the organisms which are likely to cause infection, the top five or six, and their susceptibility patterns are reported. Now, coming to molecular assays, um, I'm going to describe uh, this particular case, uh, which um, also highlights how important molecular assays have become in our management of infections. This is a 75-year-old gentleman with hypertension. This patient also had a PPI. He was uh, equation with sarcoidosis. He was on steroids. And then in 2018, he presented with sudden onset altered sensorium, was diagnosed to have meningoencephalitis, and the counts were high. So it was 17,000. Uh, the CSF uh, analysis was done, which showed that this TLC was on the higher side with lymphocytic predominance. So it was lymphocytic pleocytosis, hypoglycoria, glucose was just 43, and the CRP was also elevated. And modified Thwaites criteria, which is basically done to differentiate between TBM, because this is a meningoencephalitis. So TBM, as well as the other bacterial infections, uh, was um, was six. So this was not fitting into TBM. 
Now, this patient as a part of workup also had a urine culture, which was positive for E. coli, which is a significant colony count. And as you can see, this was a resistant, a carbapenem resistant E. coli. And since there is meningoencephalitis, Beal Felix was also sent from the ICU, which was positive. So based on all these reports, this patient was, uh, was on ceftriaxone, which was actually later on escalated even to uh, miropenem. So doc plus because of the Beal Felix, which is positive doxycycline, this patient was on AKT because the MRI showed that there was meningoencephalitis. And he was also on DEXA for a pyogenic, uh, also on DEXA as well for the suspicion of TBM. But the CSF analysis, which was done the same day, grew, uh, which uh, it detected that the stereo monocytogenes was positive. So in the CSF biofire analysis, the stereo monocytogenes was detected. And uh, we can see here streptococcus pneumoniae, which is the most common cause for the meningoencephalitis, was not detected. And the other, um, other uh, etiologies were also negative. So this particular patient, because of this positive molecular assay, was diagnosed uh, for the listeria monocytogenes. And we could de-escalate down or cut down also on the anti-TB drugs. Doxycycline was also discontinued. And this patient was subsequently um, initiated on the appropriate antibiotic therapy. So molecular assays have become one of the standard of care for diagnosis or management of infections in the ICU. We have the CSF biofire or the film array, array menin, uh, meningitis encephalitis panel, which detects 14 of the most common pathogens responsible for causing the community-acquired meningitis. And However, we must remember that it does not detect MTB rickettsiosis, and at the same time, it does not detect Enterococcus acinetobacter and the other viruses like the Nipah, KFD. So if it is a nosocomial meningitis, it's very important to always send the gram stain and aerobic culture also because the other possibilities of Enterococci as well as the, um, as you can see here, Klebsiella pneumoniae is also not detected. So these can be missed out if only a CSF biofire panel is sent. So always send the battery of tests, including the gram stain as well as the aerobic culture. There are other molecular assays for the different syndromes. So we have the URTI, which is from the nasopharyngeal uh, swab, as well as the LRTI panel. And this LRTI molecular assay can also be performed on the pleural effusion. So pleural effusion or the empyma specimen can also be sent for this LRTI biofire panel. If the patient has got diarrhea, then there is a film array GI panel. And now we have a bone and joint infection panel also. And we also have this BCIT panel, which is now being available, which detects 24 of the common bacterial pathogens. This particular patient who was diagnosed with listeria monocytogenes and the early diagnosis was because of the biofire panel. The culture grew this gram-positive bacilli, which the microbiology initially thought that it is a diphtheroid. So these are considered to be the contaminants and they were about to discard it. But luckily, we were called in and we had a close communication again with our microbiology friend. And this was further incubated the organism isolated was listeria monocytogenes in the uh, susceptibility report. And the susceptibility report um, showed that uh, it was reported as vancomycin susceptible. So the neuro ICU um, started this patient on vancomycin. But uh, we have to always look beyond it. What is beyond the susceptibility report? So here, this patient is uh, having infection with Listeria monocytogenes and the drug of choice is ampicillin genta. This is not reported by the automatic systems. We have to ask them for separate, separately. And later on, the vancomycin was discontinued and ampigenta was initiated. So always look beyond the automated reports and know which is the drug of choice for that particular bug. This information or knowledge is also very, very important for us clinicians. And 
uh, again, uh, the molecular assays are useful nowadays much more because they can also tell us regarding the mechanism of resistance. So we have the CIFID expert CARBA R, which can be done on the positive gram negative bacilli, especially the which can be done on the anterior bacteria. Say. And it tells us whether it's OXA48 or it's a combination of OXA48 with some other mechanism of resistance like the NDM or it's NDM alone. And based on this, we can choose our antibiotic therapy. If it is OXA48 alone, then we can use septicidium avibactam. If it is NDM, then a polymyxin based therapy or a combination of septicidium avibactam with astronum can be a treatment option. Uh, if um, we have this MECA gene or the MRSA is being isolated, the treatment option will be very different from what we do or what we use for the MSSA. For MSSA, cloxicillin, flucloxicillin are the drug of choices. Vancomycin, tycoplanin have late sidal activity and are not the drug of choices for the MSSA. For diarrhea, noscomal diarrhea, CIFID expert can be performed for detection of the C deficit. This is, uh, this is basically a slide which shows the CIFID CARBA R reporting. And this is a patient who has got OXA48 detected from the Klebsiella pneumoniae. And this is the CAS AV susceptibility with the MICO1. So the take home message is that more and more, of course, we are using molecular assays and they help us in the rapid diagnosis as well as the, um, as well as fine tuning our antibiotic therapy. Now, We'll go beyond the obvious culture reports. Just an example on this. This is a patient who was admitted with road traffic accident, and this was Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which was uh, isolated uh, from the wound. And when we look at the susceptibility here, it's colistin, which is uh, reported as sensitive. However, the carbapenem, if you look at the carbapenem, miropenem is completely uh, is resistant. Uh, imipenem is resistant. Miropenem is reported as intermediate here. So this is possible because of the, uh, if there is alteration in the PBP, then imipenem is going to be uh, going to be resistant. If suppose efflux mechanisms are more active, then miropenem is going to be resistant. Now with this here, we look at the septazidine, which is reported as susceptible. So can we use septazidine in this patient with pseudomonas? But... So we have to see whether it's really this particular report is completely reliable or there is something hidden into it. Because here we have the IMI and the MIRO, which is resistant. So whether we should use cholestin-based therapy or we should use a septazidine-based therapy. So we went and requested our microbiology team to, um, to look at the susceptibility pattern of the imipenem and the septriaxone, both the discs was placed. And here we can see that there was flattening of zone. So this is like a D test. And this is, this is um, indicative of a inducible MC, which means that we cannot use septazidine in this particular patient of pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. And this patient was treated with a combination therapy of cholestin. So to summarize, lab diagnoses have become the backbone for treatment or management of various infectious diseases. Um, diagnostics have to be chosen very carefully based on the clinical syndrome and the site of infection. It's very important to clinically interpret these diagnostics, which is critical in the management of critically ill patients. And all this requires collaboration of the various specialities, including the intensivist, the infectious diseases, and the microbiologist. Thank you so much. May I please stop your share screen? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Lovely flowers, thank you very much. So many cases, you've got a plethora of cases. As you know, that is the best way to go about things. I just jotted out some points, maybe we can clarify a few things. So you said, you know, in a patient who's catheterized, you know, after a few days, culture will be, he'll always have uh, growth and he'll always have pus cells. But what if he does not have pus cells? Does that rule out uh, uh, infection? Yeah, if the pus cells are not there, that uh, that is indicative that it is a likely colonizer or a yeah. contamination. Absolutely. Huh? But usually in the catheter sample, okay. because yeah, of the irritation of the urethra, the catheter irritates the urethra. So there will be pyuria and there will be some kind of okay, some hematuria. 
Yeah. But then coming to you know ventilated patient, this entity called VAT, ventilator associated tracheal bronchitis. So I mean, you know, this you send a sample, ET sample, it always goes something. And uh, it is now, you know, the VAT entity is very much there in the sense they said the growth is more than 10 to the power five, and there's no other reason and there's fever, and you treat it with antibiotics. Any comments on that? No, I completely agree. I think uh, um, it is, um, this is anyways a non-sterile site. So we have to clinically correlate with the, are the secretions increasing? Are, what is the consistency and the quality of the secretions also? And um, again, uh, rule out any alternative diagnosis for the infection and any uh, changes in the clinical uh, parameter of the patient. So all these various factors will help us in differentiating whether this particular isolate is a colonizer or a true infection. So do you take a, mm -hmm. yes. a cutoff in this of 10 to the power 5 or uh, will you accept a lower uh, colony count also if there is fever? And we can accept a, yeah, even a lower colony count is acceptable. And okay. similarly, even for UTI, traditionally or historically, we say significant colony count. but if a patient is symptomatic, then even a single colony count is representative of the urine yeah. infection. Then coming to Canada in the uh, ET sample or the student sample, uh, mostly ET sample. Correct. Yes. So yeah. I was mentioning that this even in the colonization versus infection slide. So in the ICU, a patient is um, maybe um, intubated and uh, the BYC is there in the sputum or the ET aspirate or the TT aspirate. So Canada mm -hmm. lung infections are extremely rare. It basically requires a histopathological evidence for the diagnosis of Canada pneumonia. Uh, so just on the basis of BYC in the respiratory specimens, antifungal therapy should not be initiated. But isolating a Canada from the respiratory specimen is also uh, indicator for us to uh, investigate further. Is there any candida growing from the other sites? And what is the clinical status of the patient? So if the patient is not responding to the antibiotic, despite being on the broader spectrum or the appropriate therapy and clinically deteriorating, then this could represent a multifocal colonization. And then we can definitely initiate even empirical antifungal therapy because blood yeah, cultures... Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Multifocal. But there is a school of thought which says uh, if there is heavy growth, right? Heavy growth in the ET sample for Canada, then one, it can predispose to tracheobronchitis again with, you know, bronchial spasm and all. And second, it predisposes to pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. So what is your uh, standard? No. Huh. So, no, no. It should not be even fluconazole as a prophylaxis should not be initiated for ICU patients who are growing BYC. It basically, uh, antifungal therapy is not recommended. No, not okay. recommended. All right. Okay. Then, then coming to this transportation of samples, what about urine sample? You know, that goes to the lab and if it keeps standing there, it will start growing. So, yes, 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 absolutely. So ideally, it should be inoculated or incubated within less than four hours. So the transport, culture. collection, transport and incubation in the lab should be as quick as possible. So a lot of these false reports will be false if the urine start, keeps standing. Absolutely. So that is why a lot of us think that the most common nosocomial infection is UTI. Absolutely. It is not so because the samples are from the catheter and they are going to go uh, going to grow something or the other. So it's not UTI. In my experience, I feel it is either clapsy or the VAP or the HAP, which is the most common cause for nosocomial infection. Yes, urine is always growing something, absolutely. It's growing, to, yes. And in fact, it is like, the, that's not the bug. The bug is yeah. something else. Then uh, just one comment I wanted to make, uh, you showed the mechanisms. So for the audience, often the bacteria have multiple mechanisms also. It's not, it's not just that one mechanism is prevalent. Often there are multiple mechanisms of resistance going on. That should Correct. Also this can also, yes, so it can be NDM with toxa. It yeah. can be, uh, if so that's what I said, like it, if suppose you have a ES, uh, if you have third generation cephalosporin, cephalosporin resistant, then it could be a OXA or a ESBL plus. 
So there is efflux pumps which are active, loss of porent channels which are active. That can also happen. You are absolutely. So, right. Just coming to the resistance, you know, this is a very important question. Yeah, you if you can clear this for me also. You know, often we get this report uh, for different antibiotics belonging to the same group, like gentamicin, amikacin, or imipenem, meropenem. Um, genta resistant, amica sensitive, or imi resistant, meropenem uh, sensitive. You know, same group. But uh, you know, one is just a different drug. So uh, how do you go about this? Because either the report is correct, or there is actually a different kind of resistance working to use the drug. So this is a very difficult situation for us. Yeah. So uh, it can happen at times, and it is because of the different mechanism of resistance. Also, if the efflux pumps are more active, then meropenem is going to be resistant more. Whereas, so you will have a, a Miro resistant, but imipenem, which is susceptible or has a lower MIC. So in that case, we can use imipenem. And of course, we can use it at a higher dosages. So maybe one gram, eight hourly or one gram, six hourly also can also be used for the imipenem. Normally, we use it. Sometimes you get genta toba differences or amica Correct. Yes. So again, for gentamicin as well as amicacin, uh, the susceptibility profiles may be different. Usually, um, we don't use normally genta in a clinical practice. For infective endocarditis, uh, you can have genta amicacin resistant, and we have to check separately for the susceptibility of uh, um, streptomycin. Yeah, but one also wonders if the report is correct or wrong. Do you, do you think it has a correct report or it can be wrong also? See, to, see, we have to then overall look at what is how it has been reported from where it has been reported. Yeah, so in but in clinical practice, it is like I don't really remember off late whether I have seen a amicacin and gender discordance as such. Not no, but, I mean, there's so many amino, like I said, right? Tobra is also there. So there is this. Uh, this but tobramycin is usually not reported as a. In okay, the well, files. Now, coming to a uh, couple of questions more. So you talked about PCR. So yes. uh, I mean, if a PCR report is positive, do you take it as positive or they can be false positive also? And can it miss it also? PCR. False positive, false negative. I mean, it has become the now. So, yeah. Oh. So correct. When we talk about, say, meningitis and kephalitis panel, as I mentioned, PCR is... Uh, it is specific, but at the same time, we have to, uh, for example, um, if it is a sterile specimen from the CSF or the blood, from that, if it is growing uh, or it is detecting, then it is a specific. Whereas, suppose you have a LRTI and then biofire panel is detecting the, um, detecting the organism, then we have to interpret it clinically, the whether, the, whether it is significant or not. And um, it, for example, the meningitis and kephalitis panel, it can miss out. Cryptococcal meningitis and meningitis can be missed out. It can miss out detecting Enterococcus, Acinetobacter, Klebsiella pneumoniae. These are also the common nosocomial pathogens which can be missed. No, because that course, is not covered. That's why. Correct. That is not but, covered. But but if if supposing is. Uh, if, if there is a... Uh, Actually, you mean, you mean that there is an infection, yeah, is but it is missing it up. Yeah. No, I don't think so. PCR is very sensitive. Very, very sensitive. Yeah. Very sensitive. We have to clinically correlate PCR. That but is sometimes the Sometimes it can be false positive, like in the lung samples, there could be a dead virus or colonized, you know, it might have been a viral infection. Correct. So it will be sensitive. We have to yeah. Yeah. correlate okay. it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So last thing now, you just about leptospira and streptococcus serology. Correct. That, False positive is more likely in a lot of, we, we are not really seeing leptospirosis like the way compared to what it comes at positive. It is a serology. Serology is non-specific and it can be, IgM can be false positive in many scenarios, infectious or non-infectious. Even sometimes adult onset stills disease, which is a non-infectious etiology, can give a positive serology for leptospirosis. And Wheel Felix, as we have seen, and that's why I showed that particular case who had Listeria monocytogenes, meningoencephalitis, had a positive Wheel Felix. So Wheel Felix is a very false. In fact, in the, um, the kit itself, 
the it mentions that it can be false positive with fever, malaria, enteric fever, as well as TB. So the kit itself is mentioning that. So everything, every serological test has to be clinically correlated and its specificity will depend upon the pre-test probability. Yeah, so if you are suspecting leptospira, if it comes positive, well and good. But, you know, it's so many times things are not clear, you know, with infections. Yeah, so for, the, <laughs> for leptos, we need to know the symptoms for leptospirosis and along with that, the lab parameters. They, leukocytosis, not leukopenia. Leukocytosis, then along with the thrombocytopenia, LFT alterations. So LFT alterations are also significant for lep uh, that can be seen in case of leptospirosis. So if you have the symptoms, IgM is negative, then it's so many times. Yeah, so in the first five days, it can be PCR. Then you then don't get it. I, is what correct. Is that is what I'm saying, Dr. Tapish. So it will depend upon the likelihood of leptospirosis. For example, in Delhi NCR, we don't see leptospirosis so much as we saw in Mumbai. Mumbai has a so lot so of leptospirosis. The of leptospira for one is essentially clinical, right? On the basis of the history and symptoms, essentially. Correct. And also diagnostic. We have, we had, we had, in fact, when I was doing FNB, so we had a patient who presented with pulmonary hemorrhage. It was ectrohemorrhagic fever. Yeah. And we, the IgM leptospirosis were negative. We sent the sample for PCR. It detected the leptospirosis. Yeah, yeah. PCR. So PCR is, uh, that's why right. PCR is not easily available. And it Absolutely. We had to send it outside. Yeah, it was yeah. not done yeah. in Hinduja. That, that's we, right. That's right. So I'm not going to PCR. We are talking about what we do routinely, you know. That. Correct. So what I'm so saying now, is just because the IgM leptospira is positive, it is not leptospirosis. Yes, yes. Uh, that's what, what I also wanted to be initiated. Yes. Now yes. coming to scrub typhus again, same problem. Scrub typhus also can be false positive, though it is much more specific. But then again, it is after one week more more often. So how do you Correct. Do? Usually after five days of the therapy. Yeah. yeah. So, so again, same problem, right? Again, you have correct. To PR or a, you can take a biopsy sample from the rash if you want. Yeah, but these are again the not very feasible and practical. Yeah, doxycycline has to be given empirically with clinical yeah. situations. Okay, then yeah. any questions from the audience? Uh, there are no questions, Dr. Nea. Thank you so much, Dr. Nea. Okay. Bye bye. Sure, sure. bye, -bye.